Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. Today, we're diving into diverticulitis, specifically the signs and symptoms and why they actually happen. And here's the cool part. This lesson includes the most up-to-date research findings right through to 2025. So if you want the latest science, not just textbook info, you're in the right place. We're gonna break this down into five parts. First, what diverticulitis actually is, then what symptoms to look out for, how doctors diagnose it, what treatment looks like, and finally, some practical notes on how to manage it or even prevent future episodes. So stick around till the end, especially if you or someone you love has been dealing with gut pain or changes in bowel habits. This might just give you the clarity you've been looking for. All right, let's start with the basics. Your digestive tract includes the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and then finally, the large intestine, also known as the colon. Now, in a lot of people, especially as they get older, small pouches can start to form in the wall of the colon. These little balloon-like sacs are called diverticula. They usually form in a part of the large intestine called the sigmoid colon. That's the S-shaped bit right near the end of the digestive line. Now, having these pouches, diverticula, on their own is actually pretty common and usually harmless. That's called diverticulosis. But when one or more of those pouches gets inflamed or infected, that's when we get diverticulitis, and that's when things can start to hurt. Now, here's something new we've learned from studies in 2024 and 2025. We're starting to understand that your gut microbiome, that mix of bacteria in your intestines, might actually play a much bigger role in diverticulitis than we thought. In fact, people with diverticulitis tend to have less diversity in their gut bacteria, and they often have higher levels of certain not-so-great bacteria, like Fusobacteria and Prevotella. So, even before the symptoms begin, your gut bacteria might already be going out of balance. Kind of like a warning light turning on before the engine overheats. Alright, let's walk through the symptoms one by one, and more importantly, let's break down why they happen. The first big one, and honestly the most common, is abdominal pain. And not just any pain. It's usually constant, not the crampy, come-and-go kind. For most people, the pain is in the left lower part of the belly. Because again, that's where the sigmoid colon is. Now, if you're from an Asian background, the pain might actually show up more on the right side. That can make it look like appendicitis, which is also on the right. But if the pain is constant and sticks around longer than a few days, it's more likely to be diverticulitis. The pain is usually described as a dull, aching kind of discomfort that gets worse with time. And if someone presses on that spot, oof, it's tender, very tender. Why does that happen? Well, it's because that little pouch, the diverticulum, is inflamed. It swells up and starts irritating the surrounding tissue. And if the swelling gets really bad, the pain can even start to spread or feel more general, especially if complications set in. All right, next up, fever and chills. Just like with any infection or inflammation, your immune system tries to fight it off by raising your body temperature. So if you're feeling hot, sweaty, clammy, or just off, your body might be responding to an infection in the colon. And if that infection escapes the little pouch, say, it leaks out or causes a small tear, then things get really serious. We're talking abscess or even sepsis. And that's when fever becomes a major red flag. Okay, next symptom, changes in bowel habits. Now, this one is really interesting. You might get constipated or you might have diarrhea or sometimes even both, alternating back and forth. And the reason for that is when your colon is inflamed, it doesn't do its job very well. Stool can get backed up, causing constipation. Or, on the flip side, the inflammation might irritate the colon so much that it overreacts. And boom, diarrhea. On the Bristol stool chart, constipation shows up as types 1 to 3. Diarrhea is more like types 6 and 7. Normal is right around type 4. And here's a 2023 update. Recent studies have found that not just constipation, but also frequent bowel movements, like going too often, can be linked to diverticulitis. So, both extremes? Yeah, they matter. They're both worth watching. Moving on, nausea and vomiting. Now, not everyone gets this, but when they do, it usually means things are more serious. What might be happening is that a diverticulum is so inflamed and swollen that it starts blocking the passage of stool. That's called an obstruction. And when that happens, stuff backs up, from the colon to the small intestine, and sometimes even up to the stomach. That backup can trigger nausea and eventually vomiting. If you're throwing up and you've got belly pain, that's a situation where you should see a doctor fast. Let's talk about bloating or gas. 
Yeah, that tight, uncomfortable, I feel like I swallowed a balloon feeling? That happens because the inflamed section of your colon isn't moving gas properly. Everything just kind of gets stuck. Okay, here's a surprising one. Urinary symptoms. This one catches a lot of people off guard. You might feel like you have a urinary tract infection, like you need to pee all the time, or you get that burning sensation when you go, but it might not be a UTI at all. Here's why. Your bladder sits right in front of your sigmoid colon. So if a diverticulum in that area gets really inflamed, it can press against your bladder and mimic UTI symptoms. So if you're feeling that urgency to pee, along with lower belly pain and maybe even a fever, yeah, that might be diverticulitis, not a bladder infection. Last on the symptoms list, fatigue and malaise. Now, I know that sounds vague, but it's real. When your body is busy fighting inflammation or an infection, your energy drops. You just feel off. You might be tired, sluggish, or like you've got no fuel in the tank. Okay, so how do doctors figure out if you've got diverticulitis? Usually it starts with a physical exam. A doctor might press on your belly to check for tenderness. Then they'll run some blood tests, mostly to check for signs of infection, like a high white blood cell count. But the real game changer is a CT scan of your belly and pelvis. That's the gold standard. It helps doctors see if there's swelling, infection, or complications like abscesses or blockages. In mild cases, they might skip the imaging. But if your symptoms are moderate to severe, that scan can be a lifesaver in ruling out other conditions like appendicitis or even colon cancer. So how do we treat it? Well, it depends on whether it's uncomplicated or complicated. If it's uncomplicated, meaning no abscess, no perforation, no blockage, then the treatment is usually pretty conservative. You rest, you stay hydrated. You might go on a clear liquid diet for a couple of days and then slowly ease back into normal foods. Now, here's the part that's changed. You might not even need antibiotics. Yep, you heard that right. New research from 2024 and 2025 is showing that many mild cases recover just fine without antibiotics. That means fewer side effects, fewer complications, and a more targeted approach to care. Now, if it's complicated, like you've got an abscess or a small perforation, then yeah, you'll probably be hospitalized. You'll get four antibiotics and maybe even have that abscess drained. And in rare cases where it's really severe, surgery might be needed. But even here, the treatment is changing. Surgeons are now moving away from older, more invasive methods. They're using minimally invasive techniques and favoring what's called primary anastomosis, which basically means reattaching the healthy parts of your colon directly, instead of removing a section and creating a temporary colostomy. Now let's talk prevention. Is there a way to stop diverticulitis from coming back? Well, while there's no magic bullet, research has given us a pretty clear picture. Eating a high-fiber diet helps. So does drinking enough water and staying physically active. Avoiding smoking and cutting down on red meat. That helps too. And here's a major 2025 update. A huge study involving over 180,000 people showed that five habits, eating high fiber, not smoking, regular exercise, a healthy diet overall, and limiting red meat, reduce the risk of diverticulitis, even in people who were genetically predisposed. So yeah, your lifestyle still matters even if your genes say otherwise. All right, let's wrap it all up. Diverticulitis happens when those small pouches in your colon, the diverticula, become inflamed or infected. It can cause pain, fever, changes in your bowel habits, and even urinary symptoms or fatigue. Thanks to the research from the past few years, especially from 2022 to 2025, we're learning more than ever about the role of gut bacteria, lifestyle, genetics, and how to personalize treatment. Knowing the signs early and understanding why they happen can really help you or someone you care about get the right treatment faster. If this video helped you out, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Subscribe for more easy-to-understand medical breakdowns and drop a comment letting me know what condition you want me to cover next. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson.